Hi, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of the Perform Happy Podcast. My guest today is David Kukuchi. He is one of the national team coaches for Team Canada. And uh, some of his long list of claims to fame include coaching three-time Olympian Ellie Black, who is you know Canada's superstar. He also ca- coached the national team to their first ever world's medal in 2022, which qualified them to the upcoming Olympics. Also a two-time Olympian, Um, David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rebecca. And hi, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I so I have so many things I want to I want to talk about, but maybe we can start with your own personal gymnastics career, um, which in and of itself was was exceptional. But I'd love to talk about um like I you mentioned that you were a late bloomer and that your dad, who was your coach, said that you were not actually even a natural gymnast starting out. So can you can you let us know how that translated into you becoming a two-time Olympian? What was that journey? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm from a gymnastics family. My dad did gymnastics in Japan for his university, and then he moved to Canada soon after that, and has been coaching ever since. And then uh, after he met my mom, she became a coach. She was involved in lots of other sports uh, before that. And then, yeah, my uh, my younger sister was pretty close to my age. Um, she did gymnastics as well until she was 14 or so. And then we have another sister who's a little younger who, did, who didn't do gymnastics. But yeah, it was really uh, a big part of our family. So I just kind of started that way. And uh, I liked it and kept going. And yeah, my dad was my coach uh, throughout my throughout my whole career. And so I, I went from from being like a baby in the gym until I was 28 and I retired after the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Wow. And, and so you were always known as, um, kind of level-headed and calm and consistent. Is this something that was trained into you? Do you think you just came, came into the world this way? You know, where, where did that part of you come from? Was it developed? Mm, Well, I'm a pretty calm person in general, I think. And, uh, with my gymnastics, that came from my dad for sure. And a lot of or everything from my own career, but then a lot of how I coach now came from him and his kind of style and personality. Uh, and so I wasn't, I wasn't as talented as some of the other members on the national team, but I was really strategic in what, what I was practicing and why. And uh, so I knew that uh, you know, I had a, a couple of strengths that could help the team, but on the other events and even on my good events, uh, I had to be really consistent and I kind of created a, a little spot for myself where I uh, petitioned to be the one that would go start the team off and be the first one up on most of the events and uh, tried to convince the national coach at the time that that was, you know, that was a great role for me and I could do that and I would you know, always start the team off strong and take the pressure off of, of everybody else a little bit. And so, and that's what I, that's what I did. And so my routines were really built towards consistency and in my practice, uh, just working on those routines for the most part. And if there was any key upgrades I was working on, then I, I would work on those, but not really a million other things at the same time. Uh, and then, yeah, and it, it worked great for me. I was on every major team for Canada from 2001 to 2008 and it was yeah it really had to be very strategic because I didn't have uh as many strengths as some of my teammates oh, interesting and I, I love that discussion on roles within a team that there's going to be the you know the guy over here who's throwing the big skills and the you know kind of wow wowing and then you're here competing the same routine that you know inside and out upside right side up and you're being really consistent in practice to create that so Mm -hmm. for for someone who is really inconsistent in practice what would be um you know a tip for them to kind of step into more consistency with their routines um yeah i think well one i would when i was thinking about my routines and what they were going to be i would think about you know putting my hand up and actually saluting and thinking about what i would feel comfortable and confident in in that moment, you know, when everything is on the line, would I feel comfortable with this skill or or not? And that kind of, as early on in the process as possible, I would try and weed out the skills that I wasn't going to be feeling good about. Uh, and then, yeah, just having a positive mindset in competition and trusting yourself and trusting your training and trusting your teammates and 
uh, one or two key words or visualizations for yourself uh, on the skills that would be, you know, the trickiest ones in your routine. So having, having, well, even consistency of mind, consistency of mind, mm -hmm. consistency of body, that everything is exactly the same in practice as it is in a meet and there's mm -hmm. no variation. And yeah, I just thought of one more thing. Uh, and this is something I really carry forward in my coaching is trusting yourself in the lead up to competition or trusting the athletes. And so a lot of times as the competition is getting closer, it's maybe one week away and they're two weeks away and then you might feel like, okay, I need really need to kick it into overdrive right now. Or the competition is two days away and it's like, I just got here at the competition. I need to do, you know, so many routines of this and so many skills of that and whatever. But if you're overdoing it, especially if you're in a new environment or doing more than your regular practice, you're putting yourself into new territory where you maybe wouldn't be as comfortable or you're tired out for the competition. And then if you're tired out, plus all the new stress of competition, uh, you can, yeah, get yourself in trouble that way. Or, you know, if, if you're having a little issue with something, either a little mental block or a skills just not working that well uh, for a turn or for a day, having trust that it'll be okay. And so a lot of the times I feel like it's just something small changed in your brain. Either you're in a new spot and the light is somewhere new and that messed things up a little bit, or, you know, you're something is a little sore, a little bit tired. And so it's working a little bit differently. And if you can just have the trust in yourself to leave it for later or leave it for the next day or whatever, it'll probably work itself out. But if you really panic and uh, try and fix everything all at once and do 30 extra tries at it, you're probably going to create some more issues somewhere either with over training it or, you know, you're thinking about things that you never think about and then that messes you up and, so yeah, having more confidence and trust in yourself, especially in the lead up to competition is, is going to be really useful. Mm -hmm. And now for the coaches. So I, I would completely agree that, you know, the week before you're just doing what you do, you're, you're just doing what you do. You're doing, and, yeah. but the coaches sometimes will be like, well, if you're not getting it, you have to stay and you can't, you, if you don't get this, you're not competing and you have to do it this week. Or there's so much stress that can happen for a coach when they see a hiccup happening the week before yeah what suggestions do you have for that coach you know to kind of find and, and that it kind of depends like if it's a new skill that's not ready yet then maybe that it needs some pressure it needs a decision if it's something that's normally okay and you're just having trouble for a day or two or a turn or two you know you can probably <clears throat> probably leave that one alone and it'll be all right or it's got some other some other cause uh but yeah it goes for coaches too a lot of times it's like, okay we're at the competition we're going to do this 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 and you're going to do it better than ever in the warm-up and you know seeing what everybody else is doing and maybe asking the athletes uh to do something different than normal or more or you know or you're acting different and so they get a different vibe off of you where you know, if especially if you're prepared or if you've got uh, experience, then you can, you know, you can lay off or take it a little bit easier because the the goal of a competition, especially for athletes as they, as they get to be more and more experienced as they get older, is to just have them feel good in their body, in their mind, and then they're going to be okay in the competition. And so, the more panic there is, or the more anxiety there is, uh, it's going to be harder. Mm, what a great point that they just want to feel good. I was talking to Cassie Rice a while back and she would always make her decisions based on how's the athlete going to feel? How's the athlete going to feel about this skill versus that skill or this choice or scratching or competing? And if, and if your goal is to have them going in feeling good and ready and calm and trusting, then that's going to bring a different energy to coaching than someone yeah. who's you know, like be perfect, be perfect, be perfect. <laughs> they already are doing that internally because they're... yeah, and if you can just also from the coach's side, if you can just trust that the athletes are trying their best, like they they want to do a good job, they want to compete well, and so you're on the team together. And so it's not, oh, you didn't listen to me or you didn't do this right or you didn't do that right or you weren't here this day or whatever. Like, what did you do wrong? Like if you if you come at it from your 
you know, they're trying to do a sport that's really hard and they're trying their best. And with that will come struggles. With that will come issues and problems. And that's all part of it. And that's all okay. And if you can feel that for yourself as a coach, then that's easier to pass that on to your athletes. So when they're struggling and say, yeah, of course you're struggling. This is an insanely hard sport and you're trying to do it up at the, the top of your abilities. Like you're pushing yourself. It's hard. This is part of it. This is normal. And if it, you know, if it, if you were just breezing through everything all the time, that would mean you're probably in the wrong category or, you know, you're not pushing yourself or so if you're, if it's, if it's tough, sometimes that's normal. That's what you're trying to do. And whatever sport or whatever you're trying to do in your life, if you are pushing yourself to be the best you can be, that's hard and it's not always going to go smoothly and that's okay. And that's part of the process. And that's, you know, how, how we get better up and down, up, up that hill. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that it's interesting how, when, when I explain that to kids, they, they look at me like, really? Oh, mm-hmm. oh, it's actually okay to fail, fail. And I go, yeah, if you're not failing regularly, you're in too easy of a level because <laughs> these skills are too easy if you're just hitting and hitting and hitting. Yeah. So that means that it's time to level up. You know, I, I talked to a girl earlier. She's like, well, the, my first double back off the bars, if it's bad, then I go, oh, no, it's bad. And I go, well, if your first double back was always perfect, it's time to be twisting because that's mm-hmm. too easy for you. So yeah. Of course, it's going to be a little off because you're still mastering it. So mm-hmm. it's great. And then, uh, yeah, along with the trust and competition is the kind of the the point of view that you take. And for athletes and for coaches sometimes too, it feels like the closer you get to a stressful event or a competition or whatever, the smaller your view gets. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I know lots of athletes that if something is going, if they're in a stressful environment and something is going wrong for two turns and that's the end of the world. And then if this is wrong and then the next turn is probably going to be wrong. And if today goes wrong, then the week goes wrong and then the competition goes wrong and look, all these 20 things that happen down the line and you're all, you've wasted 10 years of your life. Uh, <laughs> and so if you can have a bigger view of it and the bigger you can, the, the better. Uh, although, yeah, sometimes a smaller view helps you to get motivated in the moment. But if you can say, oh, I had two turns that weren't that good. This has happened all the time. And I know how to handle this. No big deal. This is what I'm going to try and do. And then that's going to probably work out better than digging yourself down into a big hole where everything in the future has gone wrong and you've ruined your whole life. It's, I mean, it's so true when you, you know, to be 12 years old and go, well, my, my college dreams are over now because those two clear hips were bad. You know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. 12 can or we, 22 can we or 32 that? or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We all do it. Right. So mm-hmm. it's so important to be able to back out and go, how much does this really matter in the scheme of things? And how quickly can I learn to bounce back? Because everybody makes mistakes. I imagine you, you know, you work with Ellie. She probably makes mistakes. <laughs> She's all not time. just perfect all, mm-hmm. all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so what she's had remarkable success. We we can all agree with that. What coaching strategies have you put into place that that have set her up for some of that success? What's working? Between the two uh, well, yeah, it's been a long career for her. She's 28 right now, I think. Uh, and she started as a senior at 15 and a junior before that. And so it's her style of training. My style of coaching has changed throughout. I, was, I wasn't her first coach. I started working with her when she was around 13, 14 and uh, took over more fully around 16-ish. Uh, and so all a lot of the great things that she can do, she she learned from her previous coach at the same at the same gym. I was coaching boys and I was training and that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, at the beginning, when when I started working with her more, her main training partners were boys because I I was a boys coach. I still am a, a boys coach. And so I do both at the same time right now. And so as a 15, 16, 18, 20 year old there weren't that many of the same age kind of trying to do the same thing on the women's side at our gym. But I had a a group of always had a group of boys around the same age that were, you know, high performance. And so that was her main training crew. And so that was really important to have that group of friends around and people trying to do, you know, similar, similar things. And, and then also I like the, 
kind of general training style on the boys' side more. Uh, and, and maybe the girls' side is moving a little bit farther that way. But the boys are less or they can be more patient because they're there has been more time, but I think on the WAG side, the time is coming too. People can stay way longer. It's not a race to see, uh, or it doesn't have to be a race to see who can do the most by their 13th birthday. Uh, and you know, Ellie and Danelle both had new skills invented, I think in 2022 at uh, 22 years old and 26 years old or something like that on, on their worst event. Uh, and so, you know, they, they're still innovating at a you know in their 20s and it's i'm so proud of them for for that but yeah it's the that style of taking a more patient approach and not being on her all the time about every little detail one because i'm yeah i don't know all the details and that's okay too uh but uh, that's not my style as a person i would really i would have disliked it as a, an athlete and especially as a coach if there's somebody over my shoulder every turn telling me all the stuff I did wrong and what I should do better uh like if I yeah I I wouldn't stay in that environment so I I like to give my athletes more space to you know if if there's a couple of mistakes it's no big deal if it's getting to be consistently having a problem then we'll look at it a little bit closer but I yeah I want them to be able to understand what's going on and fix any problems themselves. That would be the, the number one uh, outcome is they, you know, figure out, well, if this is happening, then I should work on, or then I should think about this and see if this works. That one didn't work. Okay. I should think about this. Oh, this is working today. So being more self-reliant and, because then if you do that, then you really understand your gymnastics better and the skills better and how it's actually working instead of just mm, following directions. Uh, and, and yeah, and so, and even now when they're older, like a lot of the time coming up with their own practice plan or, you know, how do I want to attack this? And we'll work together more on the big, on the big picture, but on a day-to-day -day basis, mm, for the most part, it's, it's led by, led by them and then sometimes I'll take a little bit more control of it but yeah I really like the liked the ability to do that kind of thing as an athlete and now as a coach to not have somebody telling me what to do all the time and just kind of thinking about what I think would be best and trying that uh and there's times where you know they're looking for more feedback and I'll try and try and do that but yeah I want them to to know what they're doing why they're doing it and and understand it now, does this take a, a certain type of individual to coach this way? Because I can think of, you know, the coaches out there who are going, what? It'll be a free for all. We can't just let everyone come up with their own plan. Yeah. If I was coaching a group of 12 year olds, I couldn't do that or it wouldn't be very effective. So these are all like, I, yeah, most of my athletes are 16, 18, 20, 28 years old. And so they're there because they want to be there. They understand it. They all have their own goals and what they want to accomplish or how much they're willing to put into it. And all of that is fine. If they understand what they want to do and what they want to try and get out of it. And then, you know, if we can understand the same thing, whatever they want to try and do, it's great. So I've got, you know, some people who are there all the time for every practice and really trying to be the best they can be. And some people who are there once every two weeks and just want to come in and swing around and do whatever they want and stay in shape a little bit and see their buddies. And that's fine too. Uh, as long as, you know, as long as we're both on the same page, if I was expecting that person that's in just once in a while and trying to get them to the Olympics, like that would be a really difficult situation. Uh, but since, yeah, since I, I know what they are trying to get out of it, then that's no problem. And if they ever want to change anything, that's okay too. I just want to help them to, uh, yeah, achieve what they want to achieve and then yeah I, I'm just remembering now you asked something about coaching style and for I feel like for each athlete I, I try and be a little bit different and match that to what what they're trying to do and so for myself I mentioned that I was a really strategic competitor and uh, everything was built towards consistency uh, and I maybe like I was better at rings so I would try and build my rings up a little bit more but with an athlete like Ellie 
she had different goals and different possibilities. So her style of gymnastics started out really differently. So she was trying to, in 2012, she was trying to make the Olympic team out of nowhere and, you know, pass a bunch of people. She wasn't on the national team until like about three months before the Olympics or something like that. And so she was really trying to open some eyes and push her way on there. And so she had to take a lot of risks to even have a chance. And so she understood that we were on the same page and this is what we were going to do. We were going to push the envelope on a couple of things to, to see if it could make the difference. And so, yeah, that it ended up, everything ended up working really well. Uh, and then later on it was, you know, there was goals to be up at this level in the world and the all around or making a world beam final and how to do that, or, you know, trying to win an Olympic medal and what kind of things would be needed for that or helping to, uh, have Canada qualified to the Olympics. And so things would be built a little bit differently based on what the goal was. And so, you know, when early on in her career, making the beam final was the goal. And to do that, she would have to do a back full twist probably, which is uh, super high value, gives her lots of points, but it was like a 50-50 chance, even at her best. And But the goal was to make it to finals. If that was the only way, then it was worth taking that risk. And so she did. And then in the finals, it didn't always go great, but she made a lot of finals. But it was, you know, kind of live by the sword, die by the sword. And that was OK. You know, she was going for big things. She needed the risk. And so she took the risk. Later on, she got better with the rest of her beam routine. And then maybe she didn't need the full twist anymore to make it to the final or to challenge for medals. Uh, so we took it out for a while. And because she, you know, didn't need to take that risk. And so things were a little bit more consistent. And then through near the end of COVID and lead, leading up to the Tokyo Olympics, <clears throat> it seemed like the beam level around the world was really going up. And so, you know, to challenge for an Olympic medal, she was going to need to put it back in. So then we worked on it's like, OK, what are all the things you can do? Let's try a routine like that. And so it's pretty risky, but we'll, we'll practice it. And so based on what the goals were and what her uh, potential was we changed approaches that way uh, and so it's been yeah different over the years based on different circumstances or if there was some injuries involved or whatever you know we do things differently and for Danelle uh, she you know she her goal was first to get onto the national team so what makes sense to do that and then to get Cardizo to be a funded athlete and then it was to make world championships and then you know what kind of what makes sense to do for for this and everything was a little bit <clears throat> a little bit different and what what made the most sense and you know so just tailoring the coaching approach and what strategies to use what comp or what routines to build for what they're trying to accomplish and what you know what might be possible what's going to be likely and uh so yeah a lot of a lot of strategy around that way well i think that that you know obviously you're talking about the super high elite level it also can apply to you know, optional level gymnasts also who, you know, you'd look at their goals as a coach and go, okay, if your goal is to compete in college, then we have certain building blocks that have to be in place. If your goal is to go win and not do something that terrifies you, then we will have a different strategy yeah. that might get you more points, but have less building blocks. Or And, and I know a lot of gyms get sort of stuck in the, our goal is scholarships. Mm -hmm as yep. a culture, um, it sounds to me like you've got, you have the ability to see, meet your athletes where they are and set their goals with them. Um, who's setting the goals and what's your process around kind of supporting your athletes and setting and, and, you know, working toward their goals? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I want them to set their own goals, but then we'll talk about it together. And so for some people at different stages, they may not really understand uh, what a goal might mean like if I want to make it to national team it, that's great to say as a goal but if you don't know what level you're going to get need to get to or how many steps are on the way or how much it's going to cost or you know what skills are needed then those parts uh, are important to fill in and maybe that's not their goal after they learn all about it maybe it's something bigger maybe it's something smaller maybe it's something completely different or maybe that's exactly what it is uh, but yeah I want I want them to have it first and then I'll try and fill in as much of the information as possible and then see 
if that's going to fit still. And yeah, I feel like, especially with so much safe sport stuff going on over the, or like recognizing it over the past couple of years, I think with coaches and athletes not being on the same page, sometimes that can lead to problems. So if the coach thinks, yeah, we're, everybody's going to try and get a scholarship and then somebody doesn't really want to do that or, you know, put in as much as it's going to take to get to that level, but the coach is expecting it and the athlete doesn't want to do it. Like that's a trouble spot for sure. Uh, Cause if somebody is trying to make you to do something you don't want to do, you know, it, you're not going to like that uh, situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and there is, there's so much, um, you know, quote unquote, old school toxic coaching where, you know, the co- the classic line is I've been coaching 40 years and I know mm-hmm. but yet the kid is in tears and can't do their back handspring. And it's, and it's like, well, okay, you know something, but there's a missing piece here that is this child's mental health, their well-being, yeah. their sense of safety and trust. Um, and what do you think is the, the important, the most important thing that that coaches can like really start focusing on so that they can have not only the high performance, but also the mental health. Mm -hmm. I think, well, yeah, I mentioned something before about having a bigger view. And so if it's, you know, if you're, you want your athlete to do that back handspring that they're so scared of for this competition and that's so important. Otherwise this doesn't happen. Yeah. As a coach, like, well, then they don't do this and they don't do that and they don't make regionals. And then, They don't do this. And then at the end, they don't get their scholarship or whatever. But if you can zoom out farther, like you're people are doing this sport to have a good experience in their life. Like this back handspring should not be their life. Uh, This is not a make or break thing for their, you know, entire entire being. And so you can zoom out farther and it's like this back handspring is point zero 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 one percent of what their life should be or who they are as a person. This is not such a big deal. And if you can calm yourself down and calm them down, it's like, okay, like if you you want to do that, that's great. But if it doesn't happen right now, that's okay. And so let's, you know, take a deep breath and move it to a small a lower beam or whatever. Like just it's not that important. And there's mm, yeah everybody who has ever done gymnastics or almost everybody has finished with gymnastics and has moved on to other things. Uh, and so, and there, you know, they still survived. It's gymnastics is not the lifeblood of, of everything or the back handspring is not the reason for being. Uh, and so, you know, having a bigger, a bigger view of it and especially when things get stressful. Yes. And I, so I remember Danelle mentioning that she experienced her first mental block not too long ago when she was working with you. And I would love to hear kind of your, you know, sort of your top tips for somebody who is, you know, freezing up on a skill that they can physically do. How do you typically approach that? Mm-hmm. Try, well, first try and present it and get them to agree that it's likely not that big a deal. Just something has something has shifted in how their brain is processing it. And there's a decent chance that if you just leave it alone or try again or whatever, it'll be okay. And if it goes three or four times in a row or whatever, and if it's something dangerous, you maybe just don't want to let it go for three or four times in a row. But if it's, you know, it's something that's not too, not too bad, just see if it fixes itself or give it a day or a week rest and see if it's fine. And then if it's, <clears throat> still still persistent then i think the most important uh, thought process for them to have is i'm willing to work on this i want to i want to get the skill i'm willing to work on it and usually i'll ask a month from now do you think this is going to be okay and usually they're like yeah it'll probably be okay by then so if, you, if you're pretty sure it's going to be all right in the end uh, or after a little while, then it's it's probably not a big deal. We'll probably find the solution. So let's think about solutions. And so if you, it's really easy when something that you don't want to happen happens. It's really easy to think of all the problems that 
come along with that. So it's kind of the same thing as, you know, going all the way down the line and your life is ruined, but it's really easy to come up with problems and sit in that. And so if somebody's like, okay, it's not that bad. Oh, you, you think it's not that bad? What if this, 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 and this, and this other person over here, this happened to them. And it, you can find a million problems. Even if your life is going amazing, you can still find a million problems if you're looking for them. Uh, and so if you can shift for from problem-based thinking to solution-based thinking as soon as possible, you're going to get out of trouble way faster. Uh, and your first solution that you're going to try may work, it may not. The 10th solution may work, it may not. But the more things you try, and if you still want to keep trying and think you're going to get out of it eventually, you know, you'll get yourself out. And it may, solution number four, may lead to another side thought, which leads to solution seven, which leads to solution 12, and that's what worked or whatever. But if, if you didn't think of solution four, if you didn't try that, it's just like, oh, nothing, nothing's going to work anyway. Like, you, you won't get to number 12. And then, you know, if you, if you go through that process and it's, you get to solution number 12 and that worked, then great. And next time, you know the shortcut. And so it, it gives you even more confidence. Hey, remember that time on your backhand spring on beam where you couldn't do it for that week and we it took this, this, and this to make it happen? So now we know that. This is going to be, let's see if we can get this done in two days and or one day or whatever. And yeah, and just having confidence, confidence in that and thinking about solutions. And that's going to for sure help you get out of it. And yeah, there's two examples I can really think of uh, with Ellie because she she said, "Well, I know you mentioned Danelle. and so Danelle's yeah was I think uh, with tumbling is what I'm thinking about one of her one of her tumbling lines, uh, and so it was just you know having her go back a couple steps, working on some some more drills, uh, and really feeling comfortable with those, and they were in a good spot before she tried the whole the whole thing again. And it, but it would come up in stressful, stressful situations, like a couple of days before the competition, suddenly as she was more anxious, things would happen differently. She was thinking differently about it. And so calming things down helped her. Uh, but I remember with Ellie, one time she was practicing, trying to do triple twists off beam. Here's her two and a halfs are pretty good. And so one day she, she tried some triples and they were all right. And then about half an hour later, she went to floor and she lost her twisting. She couldn't twist backwards. Something had happened with the different takeoff or whatever that had screwed her up and she just got lost. She couldn't do it and she got freaked out and it was yeah, a lot of tears, a lot of, uh, a lot of panic and what we tried right away didn't work. And it took about a week uh, to figure out what was going to work and that was a hard week but eventually it ended up being starting with trampoline with front twisting really basic stuff and then working up from there that's what made it be able to come back and so it took about yeah maybe about a week to to go through that process and to feel comfortable again and then a couple months later she tried her triples again off the beam and the same thing happened on floor but then the second time it took maybe 15 or 20 minutes to feel better and get it back. And so uh, it just having the confidence and experience to have gone through that process and come out the other end. Uh, yeah, was really helpful. And I remember another time we were at a World Cup and she was going on vault in a soup full vault as her second vault at the time. And then as she was doing the one touch warm up, she felt that she couldn't twist or like she lost the feeling of that twist and was freaked out and she didn't have any other warm-ups left. And so we were talking about, it and yeah, I could bring up some previous uh, examples of, okay, here's, you know, something, I don't, can't remember if that triple twist up beam was before that happened or after, but if it was before, then it was like, remember that triple twist when we had this problem and we were able to fix it. And so let's just think about this when you do your vault your best vaults, you're, you know, thinking about these things, or you're seeing these things, or you're placing your hands in this way. Uh, and so trying to give her confidence in her ability to fix it up under stress, like with no warm ups left, and she ended up doing it great. And then everything was was fine after that. 
Uh, and then the other one was uh, with her pack. With Ellie, like her pack was the, the most difficult skill ever. She learned it pretty late. She she didn't like flyaways or she didn't do flyaways. So we had to learn it like, no, it's not a flyaway. This is something completely different. Uh, but she didn't like shoot over. She didn't like any high to low, but needed one. And she didn't like swing big on bars. Like bars was her worst event. She was scared of everything. Uh, so she learned it from a Jaeger. And that was the only way she could do it for a long time is connected with the Jaeger. And then she learned it from a kip to a little cast. And for years, that was the only way she could do it. So her backup, if it wasn't connectable, was to do a kip and a little cast and lose all the points from doing that in her routine. And it was only a couple of years ago that she decided she was going to learn it from handstand. <clears throat> and so now it's not even in her routine anymore because she has something else, but she still, you know, practices sometimes and it's not such a big deal anymore. But I spent uh, yeah, five, six, eight years of my life with my arm up like this, standing in between the bars, just waiting for her to do her pack. And sometimes she'd go, sometimes she wouldn't. Uh, but yeah, pack is the, was anyway, the, the tough scale for her mentally. <clears throat> and in COVID, uh, she lost the pack for about six months. And we tried all kinds of things. And it was so hard. And I've got pictures that I show her every once in a while of her like on the mat. So sad and, you know, miserable because the pack wasn't working. And uh, yeah, COVID was such a weird time anyway. And it was just, you know, her as an athlete in the gym for for a while. And you know, everything was really difficult about it. Uh, but she never gave up and we kept trying some different things and asking different people for help. And what ended up working uh, was she could do a swing flyaway by that point was doing a swing flyaway. So away from the low bar and having uh, some spotting blocks. So about the height of the low bar spotting blocks with a loose rail on top of them about like 20 feet away. And so she would do her swing fly away with the bar way far away, but there was a bar there in the direction she was going. And then it's okay, you can do that. Can we do it at 19 feet away? And can we, and so just moving in from there. So she found something that she could have a little bit of success with instead of just, there's a billion mats on the bar, the bars are out, still can't go. So everything was like failure, failure, failure this should be so easy. I can't do it. This is so depressing because, you know, I should be able to do it the whole scale anytime. And now I'm doing like the most basic stuff and I still can't do that. Like that's really a really hard thing. But so to, to find a way for her to <clears throat> have some success uh, was key. And then by moving it in and then doing different things, that way and you know moving the boxes closer then moving the bar closer and whatever we we did it that way and it got back eventually but that was for sure the hardest one and the longest uh the longest mental block that that I've had experience with but she yeah we kept looking for solutions kept trying to have a, a positive attitude and she she got through it did you ever sense that there was a motivation piece? I know that's a big misconception with coaches where they go, well, if she wanted it, she'd go. Uh, uh, sometimes, like sometimes that works. With Ellie, she's pretty motivated all the time. Um, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I think it does work. And that's another uh, maybe trouble spot with safe sport is, you know, sometimes you can you can force somebody into it. Like I, you could force me into doing stuff that I don't want to do by pressuring me, but the more I do it, the more I'm not going to like it. And eventually I'm going to push back and like, no, I, that's not how we're going to do things, but it can work for a while. And so it, you know, if you're trying everything you can think of, and the only thing is to try and pressure them or get mad at them or be like, yeah, well, you're not going to take things away from them or whatever. If that's the only thing that works, it's eh, hard to not do those things. Or if you, over your 30 years, if you've had that work a lot of times, and this is how I get through it, it's hard to not lean on that as a, as a tool. But you're going to be much better off if they 
if they are building the blocks to get themselves to where they want to be instead of you holding them up or balancing on something that's going to fall apart pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. That's such, I mean, so many great nuggets today. I think a lot of coaches can, can see how you can just, you know, relax a little bit. You can breathe a little bit. You can mm-hmm. give them the ability to take a step back. You can ask them what, what feels safe to you? What can you do? Wh- where should we start? And, and having that growth mindset as a person, as a coach creates the context for then going, okay, well, you know, do, do we believe it's just a matter of time? You know, what are the chances you'll have it in a month, in two months, in three months? Sometimes I have to track it out to a year. What mm-hmm. are the chances that in one year you can do that fly away? And they're like, okay, okay, a hundred. Like, great. So you know you can do it. It's just a matter of time. And just mm-hmm. being able to to take that into perspective and go, okay, coach, you know, we they can do it. Even Ellie. And I think it's so important to know one of the, you know, one of the best gymnasts in the world had a six-month mental block on a quote unquote, like easy skill that she should be able to do. And she got mad about it. And I've never met an Olympian who didn't have one at some point. Never. Mm -hmm. I mean, wait, well, have you, did you ever get one? Yep. Not too many (laughs) stuff I was doing. I was pretty sure of, but yeah, for sure. There was things that were trickier for me. Yeah. And then if you have a coach who can say, well, let's, what should we try next? And who's mm-hmm. willing to go? Because I hear so many parents who go, we've tried everything. Coaches, we've tried everything. Athletes, we've tried everything. I'm like, there are infinite solutions to any problem. There's no way you've tried everything because you're still breathing. There's got to be another way. And if you can go, if you can approach it in that way, I mean, there's nothing that you can't do. You can go and be an Olympian at 28. Mm-hmm. You know, you can, you can have your first Olympics at 28. Those are, all of those things are possible if you have that type of mindset. Well, David, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for for sharing your expertise. Um, I just can't thank you enough. Thanks for having me on. It's been great.